in the spring of 1899, the Gold family and our neighbors, the Worsleys, together with the Shottons, Mingos, Shottons, those are cooks, and the Holmes family moved to Manitoba. Uh, I do not know why our parents did not leave at this time to go and settle in Manitoba. Perhaps they were reluctant to leave so many of the family behind. And, w and what of our family at this time? Well, Nellie and Jake moved to Sault Ste. Marie, that was Grandma's oldest daughter living. And from Charlie on up, the children worked for long hours and very poor pay. Wilf took off for Manitoba after he had broken four plow points, plowing two acres in the stones. Each family was, al uh, was allowed a freight car for their stock and household goods. The men stripped the houses of all the lumber and laid it on the floor of the car, the lumber they had used in their shanties, the floor of the car. The furniture was stored at one end, the cattle, horses, and pigs and hens at the other. Charlie went in this car, Uncle Charlie, my Uncle Charlie, went in this car to tend the stock. Uncle Arthur Sims and Percy Sims in theirs. The rest of us all went together in a colonist car. Father was in charge of the tickets for the gang. Our family consisted of father, mother, Hattie, Gertie, Fred, Alf, and myself. The Sims family consisted of Aunt Ellen, her husband Arthur, Edith, Herbert, George, Stanley, Roy, and the twins, Leslie and Morris. Aunt Ellen promptly took, got train sick. Grandma had a stomach upset. That's Grandma Westcott, great grandma. Edith could not stay awake. What they would have done without mother and the girls can only be imagined. The <coughs> kids were greatly impressed with the view of Lake Superior and the great stone fields on its shores. At last we reached Winnipeg, the gateway to the west. There we stayed for three days, then took our journey to the promised land. How shall I describe it? The date was early May. The rivers were in flood. The fields and meadows were lakes. Coming from a land of hills and dales like Muskoka, it was horrifying. Only the ridges were dry, and they were covered with heavy growths of willow and poplar. The earlier settlers to the area had been held up at Cowan, as the railroad had not then got through to the valley. So the women and children were left at Cowan, while the men drove over the Duck Mountains and built their log houses and shelters for the stock. By the time we arrived, the railroad had gone through as far as Westgate. After many delays, we got loaded up into wagons with Gertie and Grandma in a buggy, father and mother on the front seat, Hattie and I perched on the boxes. Gertie drove the buggy because Great Grandma trusted her. Will and Ernest Gold walked so as to guide us the best way. There was only a trail to follow and the wagons often got stuck. It took us many hours to get to the Gold place. She found a row of three little girls lying on the floor where she thankfully joined them. Their boxcars had been unloaded on the north side of Swan River, but the stock was carried to a point nearer the homestead. Fred and Alf, with a couple of cousins, drove all the stock across country to the vicinity of Gold's place. We stayed with the Gold family until our own house was built. The boys slept in the hayloft. The Gold, Golds would tell us of their hardships before the railroad went through. When our house was up, we moved in. There were no petitions, but Mother and Gertie's, Gertie hung curtains for divisions. The house had been built on a ridge and a corral made for the stock. As soon as the water went down, the men made a place for a garden. Mother was amazed at the rapid growth. Grandpa was happy to be at home, as he had been away at work for years. Now he said he would stay home and let the young folks work out. So summer passed. At first I was afraid of the howling of the coyotes, as we had none in Ontario, but I soon learned that they were harmless to humans. The winter passed and spring came again. The cows were thin on slough hay, but soon picked up on the green grass. Then June came and the rain started. Every day the clouds rolled up. The thunder would roll and the lightning flash and the rain poured down. The roof leaked. Many a time I was awakened with rain on my face. All the pots and pans were set around on the floor to catch the drip. 
Uncle Fred and Alf slept under the, and my father slept under the table. Grandma had several jobs of midwifing that summer. Uncle Charlie and Uncle Will were working on the survey. One of the first things Grandpa did was to organize a Sunday school, as we only had church services every two weeks in the Gold House. There were many young people around at that time. The Fraser family lived about four miles away, and the older lads would come, also the Sims, Golds, Holmes, Shottons, and Worsley. After the rains, the weather turned hot. July and August went by with haying and other jobs. We had only one horse, Big George, to do all our hauling, etc. During this second summer, Big George began to get thin and poor looking. We didn't know it, but he was getting swamp fever, the scourge of the horses from the east. On into the summer, another kind of fever broke out in the valley, our old enemy, typhoid. Mother was away on one of her cases. I had gone on a visit. Father came for me in the wagon. On the way home, he told me he had a bad headache. I still remember the smell of the sloughs as they were drying up. The next I knew, I was sick myself. I had sometimes suffered from bilious headaches, and we thought this was another. Father came home, mother came home that night and noticed how very feverish I was. We went to Sims to ask them to go for a doctor. I was raving in delirium when the doctor came. He took one look at father and said, my man, you've got the fever. Three weeks later, I was on the mend, but our dear father died. September the 29th, 1902. Will and Charlie came home for the funeral, which was held from our house. Mother had been constantly nursing father until his death and collapsed at his funeral, my great-grandmother. And uh, she was had been staying at the Simses, but she came to grandma's, to the tall's place, and she had been sick herself. She was old, old. But she said, I'm going with Polly. Polly must not walk alone. And I, it breaks me up every time I hear it because it, it was so sad, you know. He was just a young man. He was only in his 50s, you know. He should never have died that young. And left all these kids. They, uh, Aunt Ethel was about 12. Dad was 15 and, and left Grandma with all. She, she was a widow at about 50, the same age as I was divorced. And she lived all those years alone. And, and uh, But that's what her mother said, Polly must not walk alone. Uncle Fred and Alf, my father, had caught the fever themselves, and Mother had to begin her nursing duties all over again. Hattie had been nursing me while Gertie did the housework and cooking. The two boys had a milder case than mine, but their fever would rise every afternoon, and they would get delirious. Fred was terrified of the great spiders that he thought he saw on the ceiling. Alf said the room seemed to enlarge and then start to shrink until it was about to crush him. Then they would call for Mother to come and lie beside them. Our doctor, Dr. Hill, said we must not eat solids until our temperature was normal, as theirs went up uh, each day. They would groan. Ten more days. And the story Grandma told me about this when Grandpa died was he was not supposed to have solids. But the night before he died, he said to her, Polly, I'm dying, and I'm not going to go on an empty stomach. She cooked me some meat and potatoes. And she did. And that was his last meal.